All right. So our next speaker is uh, Charlotte Aiton from the University of Rochester, who will be telling us about multiplayer rock, paper, scissors. Thank you. And um, thanks, guys, for organizing Bugcat and for having me back. Uh, this is my my third Bugcat and my first virtual one. And so I'm, I'm very happy to virtually be here. Um, yeah, so today I will be talking about multiplayer rock, paper, scissors, which is, of course, a very, a very deep and serious mathematical topic. <laughs> Um, but I hope it's also a little, a little bit fun too. <laughs> okay, so to start off, I have a story. In the summer of 2017, I lived in a cave in Yosemite National Park. And while I was living out there in a cave in the woods, I wanted to explain to my friends that I study abstract algebra. Now, of course, we're all math people here. And so we normally just call this algebra because there are even more abstract things to consider. <laughs> And, um, but I am talking about non-mathematical friends that I had out in the woods. And so I realized that rock, paper, scissors was a particularly simple way to explain what general algebra was about. And so we can think of the game rock, paper, scissors as magma, by which I mean, uh, I'm gonna use bold A or A with a uh, line under it to indicate the actual algebraic structure itself. And then that's going to consist of a set A and then some binary operation F, which takes pairs of things in A to some other thing in A. So that's what I mean when I say a magma. And we can view rock, paper, scissors as a magma. We can take our underlying set A to consist of three things, R, P, and S, which stand, of course, for rock, paper, and scissors. And we can define a binary operation on this set where f of xy is the winning item from among xy. And now if you're from a culture that probably most every culture has this game, uh, your culture may have different names for the objects or different, um, different words for them. But uh, the rules of the game are we each choose one thing from among uh, rock, paper, and scissors. And we choose those things simultaneously. And uh, the rules are that uh, rock beats scissors. Um, it smashes them, I guess. Scissors cut paper and that destroys it. And so scissors win. And then um, paper covers rock, which somehow defeats it, I suppose. And um, so there's sort of this cyclic relationship where they beat each other. And if we, and of course, if we both choose rock, we tie and the people who chose rock won. So we can actually write out these relationships as a table, or in other words, as a binary operation. So for example, f of rp represents that the first player chose rock and the second player chose paper. And since, as I said before, paper covers rock, which defeats it somehow, <laughs> um, that means that uh, paper is the winner in this case. Okay, so we can actually view this uh, simple game as a binary multiplication on a set with three things in it. And so this is an example of a magma, which is a kind of algebraic structure that we, we might want to study. Okay. So I also realized, of course, that I wanted to be able to play with many of my friends at the same time. As much fun as it is to play with just one other person, it's really fun to be able to play with lots of people simultaneously. And so naturally, obviously, this led me to study the varieties generated by hypertournament algebras. And that last obviously is meant to be a joke, but this is, this is somehow I, I got from, uh, from those humble beginnings to this. And so now I'll explain how that happened. All right, so first of all, uh, rock, paper, scissors has a lot of nice properties. This game or this magma that corresponds to rock, paper, scissors is conservative, essentially polyadic, strongly fair and non-degenerate. And I'll explain what all of those things mean in a minute. Some of them are standard terminology. Other things are terms that I just defined, but are, I think, fairly standard uh, ways to label these concepts. Uh, I apologize. I know today has been very political already, and I did not intend for this conglomeration of terms to have such aggressive political connotations to them. Um, I don't know of anyone who is both conservative and poly, for what it's worth. Um, but in any case, uh, I'm done with my political jokes for the day. 
And um, so anyway, these are properties that we would want for a multiplayer game as well. So um, now let me explain what I mean by a multiplayer game. So I said before that the game of rock, paper, scissors uh, could be viewed as a magma or a set with a binary operation on it. So suppose we have uh, an n-ary magma, which is a set equipped with a function f, where f is now taking n tuples of elements, say a1 through an, to some other element, well, say b of a. So we can think of that as being a selection game, by which I mean that there are n players, call them p1, p2, up through pn, and each player, PI, simultaneously chooses an item, AI, from the set of available items or elements of our magma. The winners of the game are all the players who chose F of A1 through AN. And so that's what it means to have a selection game. And you can imagine it as a game you could actually play. But of course, this is basically equivalent to having that algebraic structure that I described above. So the first property of rock, paper, scissors is conser conservativity. <laughs> and we say that an n-ary operation like this is conservative, where when you take the n-fold product of a1 through an, you get one of those elements back, like say a2 or a7, but one of the elements you actually plugged in. So uh, that's what it means for an operation to be conservative. And uh, similarly, we'll say this algebraic structure is conservative when it leaves, when, um, or I'm sorry, we'll say that the game is conservative when each round that we play has at least one winning player. So the reason why this axiom makes sense is because if, if we had F of say rock and paper, and that was scissors, that would mean that nobody won that round. And that's kind of silly, you'd like it for there to at least be one winner in any round, even if it's a tie, you'd like at least someone to win. It's kind of lame if we were all to lose simultaneously. <laughs> okay, so that's conservativity. Essential polyadicity um, is the condition that f of a1 through an is actually just determined by some function on the, the set of elements. And so basically that means things like if I have f of x, x, y, that has to be the same as f of x, y, y has to be the same as f of x, uh, y, x. So uh, basically, this is summing up conditions like this into a single, uh, single axiom, where uh, we're just going to look at the underlying set of things plugged in and not actually the order or how many of them there are. This is basically because when you're playing the game, it's annoying to have to keep counts of a bunch of different things simultaneously. So this is a, a way to avoid that. And this is a form of me being lazy. <laughs> okay. So now if we denote by A sub K, all of the members of the N tuples of the set A, which have K distinct components for some natural number K, then we actually want that the, um, the number of N tuples with those uh, k distinct components that multiply to be some a are the same as the number that multiply to be some other element b. And so basically what this is saying is, um, OK, so this condition is called being strongly fair. And what this uh, fairness condition is saying is that we want each item to have the same chance of being the winning item when exactly k distinct items are chosen for any natural number k. So this is stronger than just saying each item has the same chance of winning. It has to have the same chance of winning even when we just restrict to the situation where exactly k distinct items were chosen. Um, and so this just ended up being a sort of natural fairness condition. Now, the last condition is that we want uh, our game to be non-degenerate. And so that basically means that we want there to be more items to choose from than there are players in the game. So that's basically just so that it's possible for people to choose all different items. We're never going to have, we're not going to be forced to always have at least two people choose the same item. So we have enough uh, space that we can all choose a different, a different thing to play. Okay, so those are the four conditions that I would like to have. 
Uh, so there are other historical variants of rock, paper, scissors. Uh, the French version of rock, paper, scissors adds one more item, which is the well. Uh, and so the, uh, okay, so the rock and the paper, or no, the rock and the scissors fall into the well, which means the well wins. So for example, rock times well is well, uh, but the paper covers the well, and this again somehow defeats it. <laughs> and so uh, paper times well is paper. And so that's the French variant. Oh, so this game is strong, is not strongly fair, but it is conservative and it is essentially polyadic. Now there's also the uh, more popular rock, paper, scissors, Spock lizard, which uh, appeared on the Big Bang Theory television show. And this one is actually conservative, essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate. So in this game, there are two additional items, uh, V for, for Spock or for Vulcan, <laughs> and L for, uh, L for lizard. And um, there are rules that I'm not going to give that tell you uh, which of these items defeats the other ones. OK. So it turns out that for two-player games, um, there are only valid rock, paper, scissors variants use an odd number of items. And so this is an established result in um, in graph theory as well, or is at least very similar to an established result. Um, so in our language, we can say that if we have a selection game, or in other words, a magma, um, so this n equals 2 is the arity um, of our n area operation. So if we have a magma, which is essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate, then we actually have to have that its order is odd, that it has an odd number of elements in its underlying set. And conversely, for each odd um, order, it's actually possible to produce such a magma or such a game. Um, and so the proof essentially is that we need that the number of items divides, so M, the number of items divides M choose two. And that comes from that strong, strong fairness condition. And so that's essentially the proof and I'm not gonna dwell on it, but this is also, if not exactly a known thing, it's, it's it's essentially equivalent to a known statement already. Okay, so before talking about rock, paper, scissors magmas, I'm going to talk about pseudo rock, paper, scissors magmas. And so these are n-ary magmas, which are essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate. So it's a set with some n-ary operation, which has these three conditions. Note that I don't require it to be conservative. So a pseudo RPS magma is essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate, which were the three conditions I used in this previous statement here. Although in that case, I just had n equals two and not an arbitrary arity n. Okay. So now it turns out that there is an analogous statement for uh, pseudo rock, paper, scissors magmas of any arity, or in other words, games that are somewhat like rock, paper, scissors, um, but for any number of players. And so the statement is, if we have a pseudo rock, paper, scissors magma, which has M items to choose from and N players, or in other words, has M elements in its underlying set and has arity N, and we let, um, this is this is bar pi for uh, LaTeX people, so Greek letter, it's not very popular. <laughs> Um, so if we let pi of m denote the least prime dividing m, uh, then we actually have to have that the number of players is strictly less than the least prime dividing the number of items. And so uh, if we, for example, take n equals 2, then we see that we need 2 to be strictly less than the least prime uh, dividing the number of items. And so basically this means that the number of items cannot be divisible by 2. And so it has to be odd. So that is like the earlier result that we already saw. But in general, it turns out that this is the condition that you need. And so the proof of that is quite, uh, is quite similar. We now need m to divide the greatest common divisor of m choose 2, m choose 3, up through m choose n. And uh, there's a particularly nice characterization of this uh, that was given by uh, Juris et al in the 80s. And that was actually a paper communicated by Erdish. Um, 
Okay. So we have this nice result that tells us that if we want to have something like a multiplayer rock, paper, scissors game with um, M items to choose from and N players, the number of players must be strictly smaller than the least prime dividing the number of items. And that was just like what made it so that we could only use odd numbers of items before. And it's also, by the way, the reason that the French variant could not be strongly fair because there were four items there. But for a two player game, we have to have an odd number of items. Okay. So now an RPS magma is a conservative pseudo RPS magma, or in other words, it's a game or magma, which satisfies uh, all four conditions that I stated before. It's conservative, essentially polyadic, strongly fair, and non-degenerate. And so we have similar notation for the classes of these guys, which have order M and have arity N. Okay, I feel like I've been going pretty fast, so I think I wanna just take one second and say, if you have any questions, please yell things at me. I, I do appreciate getting feedback, even in the middle of my talk. <laughs> Of course, you don't have to. I'm not going to quiz you or anything. <laughs> All right, so pe people are cool then. OK, so um, okay. So how do I get more rock, paper, scissors, magmas, right? I know I know what one of them is, presumably, is the, the usual rock, paper, scissors, magma that I defined before, um, which is this guy. All right, let's see. So rock beats scissors. All right, so that's a pretty messy picture, but that was that was the magma that we had before. All right, so in the space below, I'm going to show you how to manufacture more of these guys by hand. So what you can do is first, let's consider uh, the group Z3, the cyclic group of order three, not the three adic integers. Um, and we can look at one sets in Z3, which I'm going to denote by zero, one, and two. Well. I can map 0 to 0, 1 to 1, and 2 to 2. I can also consider two sets in Z3, which would be uh, things like 0, 1, 1, 2, 2, 0. And I can map this, for example, to 0, this to 1, and this to 2. And if you notice, I'm sort of using the cyclic action of the, or I'm using the action of the, of the cyclic group on itself by left multiplication. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at the orbit of a one set, and then I'm taking some element of Z3 and assigning it to that first guy, and then cyclically uh, permuting the elements. And then I'm doing the same thing with, the, with this two set. So I'm assigning zero to zero, one, and then I add one to each of these elements and get one, two, and then I add one to zero, I add one to zero, and I get one, and so forth. And so why am I doing this? Well, because I can define a binary operation now where I'm going to have my three elements be 0, 1, and 2. And so, for instance, um, right here, this 0 mapping to 0 is telling me that f of 0, 0 is 0. And so that would be 0. And this 2, 0 is telling me that f of 2, 0 is 2. Okay. So now if I, if I uh, do the rest of these guys, I'm going to get some binary operation. Um, 0 and 2 is also 2. Uh, 1 and 0 is uh, still 0. And uh, 1 and 2 is 1. And if you notice, this is actually the original game of rock, paper, scissors um, up to isomorphism. Oh. If I had chosen my labeling different, it would have been more obvious, but I, I promise you it is, it is the same thing. Um, okay, so now how do I get more of these things? Well, instead of Z mod 3, I'm going to replace this thing with Z mod 5. And so if I do the same thing with Z mod 5, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have more uh, one sets to consider, of course. And I'll make the same natural choice. And now I'll have some more orbits of, uh, of two sets. And I can make some choices there. So say I send 0, 1, 
to zero, then I'll send one, two to one and so forth. Okay. And so you might at least be able to buy that if I, if I use the group action in this way that I can produce another operation which has similar properties. And so, uh, okay, so I'm gonna leave that at that for now. And so formally, I'm not gonna expect you to read through this, but formally what I'm doing is the following thing, which you can actually do using an action of a non-commutative group as well. Um, and I have an example of that in the paper I have on this, but uh, I won't uh, belabor it too much. There is a general way to do the process I was just describing, which involves many, many choices, but can, can in general be done. So it turns out that if we do that same sort of thing where I define an operation by considering um, one sets, two sets, up through n sets in my, in my group, and then let that group act um, by so, some action on that set of things, then uh, we actually have that the resulting magma that I can define in the way similar to what I just did before by hand, uh, we actually always have that that's a rock, paper, scissors magma. And so, um, so where is the strongly, strong fairness that I had defined before? That actually comes from me assuming that I have a regular group action. Uh, that regular group action is going to enforce enforce that that fairness. That's that's where that's hidden away in this definition. Oh oh, I'm sorry. Not just that it's a regular group action, but that each of its extensions are free. That's the strong that's the strong fairness. That each of its extensions onto k sets in our uh, set of elements being acted on are are free. Okay. So um, a regular rock, paper, scissors magma is actually going to be uh, one of these magmas that we can create by letting a group act on itself by uh, the left multiplication action. In general, we can use any group action, but it turns out that with the constraints we have, all of those guys are going to give us magmas which are equivalent to ones that we could obtain by using the left regular action of the group on itself. So there's, there's not anything else that can happen there. So uh, subject to this list of choices that I alluded to, but didn't actually formally uh, go into very much, we can manufacture such a magma. And we call it a regular rock, paper, scissors magma, um, say G, N, beta, gamma, where N is the arity, and these beta and gamma are choices of orbit representatives for the orbits and then representatives for the individual elements of those orbits that are compatible with that group acting on itself by left multiplication. Okay, so that thing I did for uh, the two player uh, rock, paper, scissors game um, with three items and the thing I started to write down for uh, two players and five items. This is what it looks like uh, for three players and five items. So this would be Z, uh, Z5 and then three beta gamma for some choice of beta and gamma, which I'm not going to write down. And so what this table means is it's the multiplication table for a ternary operation. And so for, for instance, if I choose this spot here, what this represents is this is F of zero, uh, two, three. And in general, if you have one of these sub tables here, this represents F of three uh, X, Y say, where X and Y are then given by these two arguments just because it's hard to draw a three-dimensional array of, of uh, it's hard to draw a three, 3D Cayley table on a latex slide here. Okay, so that's the smallest, that's the smallest uh, not already known non-trivial example of one of these games is given by this rule, or that's one of the smallest non-trivial examples. All right, so it turns out, and I see that I only have six minutes left, so I'm actually gonna go faster unless there are any questions on what I already did. So it turns out that um, there is a different way to specify um, games like this, just to have a pointed hypergraph. Uh, so if we start off with some set and we look at some collection of subsets of our original set, then, um, a pointing of this thing is going to be a map which takes an edge of our hypergraph and it maps it to some element 
of that edge or some vertex of that edge. Uh, so for instance, if our hypergraph consisted of um, the collection of all, uh, say all pairs of distinct things in a set of three things, then a pointing can be viewed as mapping, say this edge to this vertex or like directing this edge. And similarly, we could define pointings of these two edges that say pointed to here and to here. And so, uh, okay, and so it's, um, it's believable that this pointing actually does sort of look like an n-dimensional version of directing a graph. And so an n-complete hypergraph is then going to be the collection of all non-empty k sets for k at most n in a set S. And so that's just like having the n-skeleton of the simplex whose vertices are S. And so the reason why I want that is because just like, just like uh, a tournament, is a complete graph with an orientation on its edges. I'm going to define a hyper tournament to be this n complete hypergraph with a pointing on its on its edges, which is like that orientation. So a hyper tournament then is a pointed hypergraph where I actually have that this underlying hypergraph is the n complete hypergraph on some set as. And so uh, if I give that pointing, that's actually sufficient to specify the rock, paper, scissors magma that I'm talking about. And if you'll notice, um, this is actually like those examples that I had started to write out before, but now for up to three sets in the set of five elements. And so this data is exactly like that, um, like the data given by that group acting on itself uh, that I described before that also gave that that um, 55555 Cayley table that I drew previously. And so uh, one can then define a hyper tournament magma, which is like a tournament magma or a sort of graph algebra as people study at the intersection of combinatorics and graph theory or in universal algebra. Um, and so uh, an N hyper tournament is the hyper tournament magma that we get by defining the product of these guys to just be that pointing of them. And so this is just like saying that if I have an edge in my graph from U to V and U dominates V or it's oriented that way, then F of UV is defined to be um, U or V either way. The one it's pointing to, I guess, is the conventional thing. And so it turns out that this definition is um, is actually precisely equivalent to saying that a hyper tournament magma is an N magma, which is conservative and essentially polyadic. So more general than a rock, paper, scissors magma, but more, more from a combinatorial definition. And so um, tournaments, as I mentioned before, are the N equals two case of a hyper tournament. Um, Hederlin and Schwadel introduced the N equals two case of a hyper tournament magma in 1965. And there's been a lot of work on varieties generated by tournament magmas. Um, so I followed this survey, which was very helpful. Now I only have a minute left, so I'm going to um, I'm going to uh, skip ahead to the last, I guess, well, the first real result that I wanted to say, which is that um, we can define a, a variety of algebras generated by the N N -ary, uh, tournament algebras. And so this is equivalent to saying it's the class of all homomorphic images of subalgebras of products of these guys, or it's all of the algebras which satisfy all the identities that the N hyper tournament algebra satisfy. We can do the same thing and look at the uh, variety generated by the rock, paper, scissors, uh, rock, paper, scissors, magmas of arity N. And so, uh, and so it turns out that actually these two varieties are the same. And so that means, uh, for instance, that every, every algebra which satisfies all the identities that an n-ary hyper tournament would is actually obtained by taking a quotient of some subalgebra of a product of the rock, paper, scissors magmas. So the rock, paper, scissors magmas are in some sense basic building blocks for all possible hyper tournament magmas. They allow you to build the most general possible ones that you could, even though they're very special. And so I did this by um, giving actually a, a pretty nice embedding, I think, from 
an arbitrary uh, finite hyper tournament into a finite regular balanced hyper tournament, which is essentially one that comes from a rock, paper, scissors bag um, All right, so I think uh, that's an appropriate place to stop. And I thank you so much again for your attention. Um, yeah, and th thanks again, Bugcat, for having me. Let's thank our speaker. Does anyone have a question? Charlotte, did you actually play one of those other magmas with your friends? Yeah, so um okay, so I've played I've played a three player one before because if you sit there you can actually write out the rules for the three player one um pretty quickly. And so I have played the three player one before. The first time I gave a talk on this at the University of Rochester in our graduate student seminar, um, I had written a computer program um, that made all of those arbitrary choices and produced a game for as many people as you'd like. And um, we played that with seven, uh, 17 people, I think it was, 17 or 18 people. Um, it was really funny because uh, one of my friend's girlfriends was actually uh, was actually in attendance and she was a neuroscience person and not a, the only non-mathematician in the room and she was the unique winner there was no tie it was just her and she was the only winner and so uh it seems like maybe math people are not actually the best the best suited to play this game but uh i have played it a couple times in general though it's quite hard to get people to play this with you i think they find it um bizarre and tedious to to try to play this game completely but uh, thank, yeah, thank you for your question. I did have a, a little question that's, that's kind of tangentially related. Why are these called magmas? Um, okay, so the short answer is I don't know. Um, the slightly longer answer is uh, is a fun bit of uh, history. Um, so, uh, so I think originally people called people called a set with a binary operation on it and no other assumptions um, a groupoid. I think that was the original thing that people would say. And then at some point, Bourbaki came along and he or they or whatever said um, said that those things should be called magmas, a set with a binary operation on it. Later on. Um, groupoids came to become categories whose morphisms were all invertible. And so topology sort of stole the word away. And then, um, and then other people came in and said that these things, sets with a binary operation should be called binars. And that's just fine, except now I want a word for the thing that's a set with a single n-ary operation on it for some finite n. And so I refer to them as n magmas or just magmas for short. So, Thank, thank you for <laughs> listening to that. I know that's tedious. No, I, I think it's interesting where these terms come from. Yeah, and, and so of course, if it's underground, it's a lava or, or something like that too. That's, you know, and Isn't I don't know what around? a volcano is. <laughs> Isn't it the other way around? Yeah, well, lava, I, lava I, is. I lava is surface <laughs> magma is underground, I think. Oh, oh okay, so if it's above the ground, all right, so now we need to define some sort of mathematical operation by which magmas can come above the ground and then they'll become lavas, of course. Where's the guy who gave the earthquake talk? Oh yeah, we should, we should do something together. <laughs> There's an earthquake and then, you know, there will be an associated magma that can become a lava under, under the uh, action of the earthquake. Uh, I hope the uh, I hope the the geology people won't be too disappointed in us. Maybe we should bring one of them in just to make sure that it's all kosher. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have a quick question. Um, so you had cited I think three names of different people who um, made key contributions to this theory, and uh, I may be wrong about this guess, but were at least two of those names Czech. Actually, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I recognize. Oh, oh, oh! I'm sorry. Not the name check, but were the people check? Yeah. Um, 
I actually don't know that for sure. Okay. Um, but I was just curious if there's some like weirdly like check some group of Czech mathematicians who are like the key, you know, movers in this in this field or whatever. So, so I think I think it is there is a there is an Eastern European connection. And so like I know that um I know that like Erdish um in addition to being connected through that other reference that I gave before, Erdish actually um also uh, spent some time at the University of Hawaii working on on hyper or on just tournament magmas, the binary tournament magmas, um, mm -hmm. decades ago, of course. Uh, and so there is, I think, just because there's a lot of combinatorics going on over there, then because it's the intersection of combinatorics and this part of algebra, then you get a lot of a lot of Eastern European okay. uh, interests. I was just curious about the history I, of the the subject. Yeah, I don't know a lot of the people personally, um, but uh, but yeah, that's that's a, a good question. <laughs> So if there are no other questions, then let's thank our speaker again. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Could you end the recording soon so I don't have to stop?